Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon and Antonio Sayant. It is a combination of Rocket Green Radio and Taking Care of Business. This week's special guest hails from Grenada. Wow. So we, we, we're expanding the globe. We have Dr. Hugh Seeley. Uh, welcome to our show. You have a great resume. Uh, you're a chemist, bioengineer. You got all kinds of cool uh, degrees. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? I'm, I'm a chemical engineer um, by, by profession. The, the, the definition of a chemical engineer is a, a, a jack of all trades, a master of none. Um, my master's and my PhD are, are in environmental science, and, and my research interests are, are climate change and, and sustainable development, in particular in the context of small island developing states. So you're in a small island. So uh, what, what do you do day to day? I'm a professor in the Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at, at St. George's University. We, we teach students, uh, we give them a master's in, in public health, uh, primarily uh, U.S. students. Now, wow. h- how long have you been doing uh, this very important work? Well, I've work? been there since 2008. Before, before then, uh, I was the Energy and Sustainable Development Advisors to the governments of Grenada, uh, Barbados, St. Lucia, uh, and Dominica. I have been a climate change negotiator on the behalf of the Alliance of Small Island States, which is a grouping of, of 39 uh, small islands in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Ocean, and in the Indian Ocean, and I've been doing that since 2007. I've attended every uh, major climate change conference uh, since 2007, including Copenhagen in 2009, uh, Paris, of course, in 2015, and, and Morocco uh, last year. Let's talk about that, because that's really fascinating, and most people don't really know. How did these conferences work? Um, who organizes them, how long do they last, and, and what's supposed to happen during these conferences? Well, if you go all the way back to, to the, 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 the Earth Conference in, in, in Rio, in Brazil, in 1992, uh, there, were, there were three major conventions that were signed at that conference, and, and one of them is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, so way back then, uh, the world recognized that climate change was occurring, uh, and that this surpassed uh, national boundaries and, and that we needed a, a global governance structure uh, to deal with this global phenomenon. Uh, so we, we, we passed uh, that convention in 1992, and since then uh, there's been a conference of the parties to the convention um, meeting annually. And then we had the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, and that set uh, targets for greenhouse gas emissions from the industrialized uh, developed countries. And then since then, in, in Paris in 2015, we had the Paris Agreement, which is a, now a, a, a legally binding international treaty that, in, to all extent, replaces the Kyoto Protocol and, and, and asks all countries, both developed and developing, to make contributions towards mitigating climate change. Now, what are the challenges that smaller islands that are not that industrial, that rely more on tourism, have, have to face? And what is their strength in these negotiations? Well, I'll take the last part first. The, our, our strength is our numbers. And under the, this convention is one country, one vote. And that's, that's usual under the United Nations. So the 39 countries that we represent out, out of a total of 195 countries is a sizable block uh, when it's one country, one vote. Uh, the, the importance of this to us is that this is not purely an economic issue. This is, this is an existential issue for a number of, of, of small islands. If if, the climate, if climate change goes on the way it is currently uh, occurring, temperature rises, sea level rises, acidification of the ocean, extreme weather wow. events, um, a number of small islands will, will fail to be, to, to be viable human settlements by, by the end of this, of this century, quite, quite frankly. Wow. So um, for, for us, our, our backs are against the wall, and this is, this is whether um, we, will, we will continue to exist or not. So that's pretty scary. So, has there been any, uh, has there been any surrounding islands that already um, has changed o- over the yeah. years? In the, in the Pacific Islands, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, you have a number of, of islands that are uh, very small atolls that have already been lost. Um, uh, there is already uh, climate change migration uh, occurring uh, from these small islands. Uh, here in the in the Caribbean, we have already experienced. Um, at almost one degree uh, Celsius of, of, of warming. Sea levels are rising at, at, at around 3.2 millimeters uh, per year already. And we are already locked into at least one meter sea level rise. Some, some people say two meters of sea level rise uh, by the end of this century. Wow. Now, in terms of sea level, uh, what would a, t- a two meter rise do to... Uh, it would be absolutely devastating to, to the island that I'm living on, Grenada, 
uh, we would lose the vast majority of our, our, our coastal infrastructure. And that, is, that includes high amenity, uh, tourism resort, um, your, your airport, your seaports, of course, your hospital, your electricity generation station. Uh, all of that is projected to be lost uh, by the end of this, of this century. Well, and when you think about it, time goes very quickly. Uh, so it's not that far into the future when you really think about it. Um, so going back to these negotiations, uh, how, who sets the agenda and how long uh, of a period of time do these conferences take place? The, the, the agenda is, is set by the parties themselves, uh, and we meet twice a year. Um, in the middle of the year, the, the subsidiary bodies of the convention uh, meet, and then at the, at the end of the year, there's, a, there's an annual conference. This year, uh, both of those meetings will occur in, in Bonn, in, in Germany, uh, which, is, which, which hosts the headquarters uh, and the secretariat of the UNFCCC, uh, United Nations Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. Uh, what we've been doing since Paris is, is been trying to put the nuts and bolts uh, onto the Paris Agreement. So we had this historic agreement in Paris in 2015. Now we have to now we have to put all the details uh, in in place uh, to make sure that that everyone knows what we're supposed to be doing. Not only in terms of the nationally determined contributions, which is the the mitigation targets that we've set, how much we're going to reduce each country is going to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions but also absolutely critical for developing countries and small islands in particular is the issue of finance. And the, the developed countries have, have promised uh, at a minimum of 100 billion U.S. dollars per year uh, that will be transferred from uh, developed to developing countries. And this is supposed to be over and above the development assistance. And, and so that, that carrot has been dangled in front of us. We now have the Green Climate Fund, which is a major financial instrument that's been, been set up and ordered in in, in South Korea, uh, but we're waiting to see the money, because without that money, we will not be able to, to, to transform our energy sectors, nor will we be able to adapt to the impacts of climate change that are now inevitable. Wow, that's, yeah. So, uh, explain, like, has the weather been changing? Because I, I read somewhere, I think in your bio, uh, there's been a lot of category cyclones that have been hitting uh, the past islands for the last uh, what, what ten years or something. Has that uh, changed any? Has there been more? And do you yeah, really we, think it, has climate change a big issue? Yes, climate change is already occurring. This is this is something that we are we are seeing uh, directly uh, in in front of us. We are we are we're seeing more extreme weather events, uh, more category four and category five uh, hurricanes. Uh, longer uh, dry uh, spells, longer longer drought uh, periods. Uh, of course, the the ocean acidification and the sea level rise are are highly problematic for our coral reefs. Um, so mm -hmm. our, our coral reefs are now are now highly vulnerable both to the, the 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 warmer temperatures which cause coral bleaching, but also the acidification, the 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 lowering of the pH, which, which then uh, virtually dissolves the the, the, the carbonate shells of the of, of the coral, and then the coral provides a mechanical barrier to, to wave action on the on the beaches, and, and and of course provide the white sand to the beaches. So if you have more extreme weather events and storm surges and sea level rise on top of diminishing coral reefs, then you have a, a, a triple whammy occurring on your on your coast. So it's it's one problem piling up on on another uh, that that climate change is, is causing. And, and please uh, accept the context that, that you're dealing with climate change in a developing country where right. eradication of poverty is supposed to be your, your immediate priority, not building resilience to, to a problem that you did not cause. Yeah, right, but I guess you know, it's, funny you, say, it's yeah. funny you say that because, um, you know, the whole Mexican and building of the wall thing, um, I wrote to a friend of mine who deals with uh, solar energy. He's an expert in that. And I said to him, you know, I wish they came in a different uh, tactic, uh, different direction, and would have and would have said something like, and and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're a scientist, so you kind of look at it in, in in a different in a different way. And just by me mentioning something like this, um, people have said it, it seems like it would be a good idea. And it, upon it came upon like if if they took it in a way, if, instead of building a wall, they build solar panels. 
huge ones, like a solar wall, that went from left all the way miles across and would help both developing countries. Well, you know, it would help the United States, but it would also power Mexico. But here's the thing. They have drones that circle around the areas that are powered by the solar wall. You know, and, and if anybody would try to jump the wall, it would pick up inst- instantaneously and alert the patrol people. So, in a way, you, you're, you're not selling building a wall to keep people out. In, in a sense, you're building a wall, a solar wall, that would help Mexico and the United States contribute into the environment. But what you're really doing is you're keeping people out but in a positive way. Well, I, I think that there's, there's, there's something called thin layer technology in, 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 in solar that's, that's, um, but they haven't broken through yet, but, but, but hopefully we will be able to paint, uh, surfaces right. and, and, and turn them into, into solar cells. I, I, I would love it where, where every, every rooftop, um, every, every wall on a building, um, right. every road, every road surface, um, uh, becomes, um, a, a, a solar panel. I, I'm, I absolutely believe that that the technology is there now that allows us to to the term that we use is decarbonize or or economies, which, which basically means we've got to stop burning fossil fuel. I know they just did a whole thing in the college in, in Grenoble College where the students, uh, five students, locked themselves in the the president's office because here's the thing, here's the discussion here. Um, to have a hundred million dollars of funding that these students do not want that money to go to fossil fuel, you know, and that, that was their fight, you know. So now the president um, is now writing a proposal uh, against that, supporting the students, and now it's over to the Board of Trustees. So, um, and then Leonardo DiCaprio saw the little video and actually tweeted it. He retweeted it all over the place because he feels the same way. You know, get rid of fossil fuel. I mean, we're talking about a hundred million dollars of funding. You know, and the students, you know, they have every right. It's their future. It's you know, the next generation. It's and and you know what? It, it hit home. And I'm walking around, and I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And I tweeted it all over the place, and I I believe Leonardo DiCaprio saw it, and all of a sudden now it's national news. So now well, I because think you've hit on. Right. I think you hit on 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 one area that I think uh, if I'm a, if I'm optimistic, I yeah. think has has significant potential to 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 move us towards um, effective mitigation of climate change, and that's divestment of funds away from from fossil fuel uh, right. companies. I think that if if that trend can can continue, um, then then yes. But that, but but don't get me wrong. This this is not that simple. The International Energy Agency has, has stated in a fairly recent report that two-thirds of all the oil, coal, and natural gas proven reserves, proven reserves, must stay underground and cannot be brought to the surface and combusted if we hope to keep global warming to less than two degrees Celsius. And we're already at one degree Celsius. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and the small islands have, have asked for a limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius, not, not two, because we, we consider it two degrees C, of warming even too much, but the, but the fundamental point I'm trying to make is that there are trillions of dollars of of assets already on the books of companies and of states of proven reserves that fundamentally cannot be brought to the to the surface, and therefore there will be stranded assets. So we have to find a way to not only decarbonize our economies, but 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 how to to write off trillions of dollars of assets. Um, out of a out of a global economy without causing the the world's economies to crash, this is mm-hmm. not a simple problem. No, let me yeah. go back to one thing that you said that's really important for people who are listening to get in context. What is it about every degree of warming that ma- why? What is it about each degree, and why is two degrees a benchmark concern? What is it about? It's not a benchmark. And we thought we thought it was a safety rail, but but it's not it's not a safety rail. It's it's um it's a precipice, uh, and that that we can that we can't go over. At at some point, we're gonna we're gonna reach a, a stage with with the warming where uh, it they will not be possible to stop the train. 
for, and and it, it will cause runaway climate change. Now that that one to two meters of sea level rise that I'm talking about, that that is with expansion of the oceans and limited melting of the polar ice caps. However, if we go above two degrees Celsius, then it is quite likely that we're going to lose Greenland and the West Antarctica ice sheets. And if, and if we do lose those, then we're talking several meters of sea level rise. And that, that's, that's catastrophic. That's, that's just not only small islands that you're, that, that you're losing. You're, you're losing the eastern seaboard uh, of the of the U.S., you're 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 losing the western seaboard of 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 of, of Europe. We wow. we are we would now be in a very very catastrophic situation. So that's 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 why we're talking about two degrees as a as a threshold. But quite frankly, uh, we'd be much more comfortable with one point five. And and we're and don't forget we're at one degree of warming right now. Now we're we're and we're already seeing the impact. Where did they? Where did we measure the one degree from? Did they pick a year as a or a, or a no, consensus? No, if, if you look at NASA, um, your your own um, uh, scientific organization, NASA, and and, and oh, they have diff- they have different baselines. The the, the zero point nine nine degrees of Celsius, uh, Celsius of warming that that has occurred in twenty sixteen. Uh, that is on a baseline uh, from around 1951 to 1980. So we're not even going back to pre-industrial uh, levels. We've only gone back slightly into the 20th century and taken a mean from there. If we go back to 1880, then temperatures have already risen by 1.1 1. 1, uh, degree Celsius. So that's a, that's a global mean average. If you, if you go in the north, to Finland, for example, uh, temperatures there have, aris- have have risen by more than four degrees Celsius already. Has the rise in temperatures peaked in certain parts of the world, but not others? That's so, that's, that's the point I'm making. Right. So, that, what, that would that that? That? what would explain that? What would explain that? Is it like an ozone depletion or something like that? Or no, no. It's it's, it's that if you if you imagine the 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 the, the world with the the, the cold poles and the and the and the warmer e- equator. And then, and then you dump a lot, a lot more heat uh, onto the in, into the world, or the, the world absorbs a lot more heat. The 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 change in temperature is going to be more drastic in the colder areas than the warmer areas. The warm the, the, the cold areas are going to are going to are, are going to see a a, a a greater change in temperature, and and that's exactly what's happened. So you're you're seeing a, a, a in, in the north in the Arctic and and in the south in the Antarctic. A greater changes in 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 delta T in in in, in overall changes in temperature, uh, but you're seeing it at the in the in the at the equator as well, um, but not as accentuated. All right, this is Richard Solomon uh, and Antonio Sayon, and we are talking to Dr. Yu Seely from Grenada, and uh, we'll be right back right after this. Keep it locked in on Taking Care of Business at Rocket Green Radio. All right, greetings from Grenada. Welcome back, Richard Solomon, Antonio Sayon, and Dr. Yu Seeley. Now, of course, we're doing this by telephone because we don't have the budget <laughs> to, to go to Grenada. But if we could, we, we, we would have been in a studio somewhere on that uh, great island, and uh, we would have done this all well, person. Well, it's about 25, 26 degrees right now in the, in, on its nighttime. And during the day, you're, it's going to go up to 29, 30 degrees. Um, I, I'm not sure where you are in the world right now, but I, I suspect you're a little bit colder than we are. Well, we, we can only dream that when we have you come back, we'll do it in a studio near you. <laughs> okay, so so one of the things they were talking in pre-production um, was what can people do on an individual basis in their day-to-day activities in terms of their purchases? Um, obviously, you know, conserving uh, energy, uh, using, I guess, solar energy in their homes. Uh, what, what can be done on a, on a residential basis, on an office basis, on a school basis? I mean, we were talking before about putting solar panels on all kinds of things. I'm, I'm surprised that rooftops in New York City don't have either water collection devices, solar panels, or, or, or agricultural components. Because Richard, don't get me started on that. Well, I we, can we go do. off on that with the Board of Education. Well, I I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question, and, it, and it's one that, that my students ask me um, uh, when, when, we're, when we're teaching them this, uh, the, the Masters in, in, in Public Health. 
and, and the vast majority of students at St. George's University are, are American students. It's, a, it's an American-owned university. And, and so they're asking, do I, do I have to stop driving my SUV? Um, can, I still, can I still have my plasma uh, TV? Uh, can I still have my iPhone? And, and, and my, my answer, and some, some people don't agree with me, but my answer is yes. That, that with the right technologies in place, and, and, if, and if we green our grids, and if we, in other words, if our electricity sectors uh, start generating electricity from renewable energy, and then we bring our transport sectors onto the grid uh, by electric vehicles, um, then we've gone a vast, vast way uh, towards uh, reducing our emissions without changing necessarily our, our lifestyles. If you do want to do immediate things to change your lifestyles, in, in, and we're living in a fossil fuel economy, well then, travel less, um, ride a bicycle if more than, 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 than driving a car, buy local, uh, so go, go and, and commute uh, locally, uh, use um, the, the, the telephone as we're using here now rather than, than, than flying off and having uh, a physical uh, meeting. Even the way that you eat, uh, eating less meat, uh, is going to reduce uh, your your carbon footprint uh, as well. And, and then, it'll, it'll also, it'll also it also politically. And I just want to I just want to put in this this this, mm-hmm. this last one because I'm absolutely convinced that if people care about climate change, the politicians will start caring about poli- uh, about climate change, and they will pass the right policies that w- uh, will get us out of of, of this crisis uh, that we're in. Well, I, I, one of the interviews that I did. A, not that long ago, I was with a, a gentleman named Dr. Michael Greger, who wrote a phenomenal book called How Not to Die. And, you know, he said, basically, eat more plants and eat less, if, if not no meat at all. And even though that was great for the environment and climate change, it also had the side benefit of reducing disease and improving health and longevity. So I wonder if, 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 if some of this can be promoted in a selfish way, which is, hey, not only is this good for the climate, but it's good for you, you know, and because people do care about their health and their, their well-being and longevity and aging and all that other stuff. Absolutely. But, but, I, but I, I do not want to remove the pressure that we need to put on the fossil fuel industries and, and, and that we need to, to, to stop burning oil and coal in particular. And, and natural gas is less, is less carbon intensive and, and perhaps it can be used as a transition fuel. But we've got to lo- leave that coal in the ground. So what Not are the... Only f- in the US, in, in, I'm, I'm talking about India and China in particular. Mm-hmm. What, those, what are the fuels those, of the large future? Persian countries, those, those are the ones that are, that are going to determine our fate. What, what are the fuels of the future other than solar? Well, some would argue nuclear. If we can get our act together, we can and we can make it more safe, and we can we can uh, deal with the with the spent fuels in a in a more efficient way. I know that there's there's a lot of interesting uh, research going on uh, into into the future uh, nuclear technology. But besides that, I I'm absolutely certain that renewable energy, um, wind and solar, are already competitive um, with with oil and 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 coal, and there are other emerging uh, ocean. Uh, technologies, ocean thermal energy conversion uh, is one. Geothermal, of course, is a is a proven technology. Hydro, of course, is a proven technology as as, as well. So I, I I am absolutely convinced that that these technologies will be able to displace oil and coal uh, and natural gas in, in the future. I know you were saying, and I may have cut you off. So I'm sorry. Uh, you talk about coal. So which of the countries that are the most dependent? On coal and use the most coal right now. You said China and India. The ones that the ones that I'm concerned about are India and China, uh, in, in in particular. Why? Because you combine those populations and you're, and you're talking about uh, one third uh, of of the world's peoples. Uh, India has over 200 million uh, people that are energy poor that don't have access to modern energy services, and. Uh, and, it's, and it's their government's absolute right uh, to to develop um, and, and, to, and to bring those people out of poverty. But how do we provide them with modern energy services? Is it going to be coal or is it going to be um, solar PV? That's the absolutely important question. Now, for China, China has already recognized its limit, the limitations of coal, and, and, and China and China has been using coal at, at, at uh, a huge, huge rate. 
building massive 1,000 megawatt coal-fired power plants every month. But what has happened to the air quality has, has, has been disastrous. Um, and so from a public health standpoint, uh, China has recognized that it's got to switch away from coal. And therefore, therefore China has been installing more renewable energy capacity than any other country uh, in the world, by far. So uh, I, I would hope that a lot of us would copy uh, what, what China is doing. Germany, of course, has gone right. through a revolution. Um, and, and has shown how, how a northern country with very little sunlight uh, compared to us in the tropics uh, can, can, can green uh, their grids. It's funny you say that because um, Apple, the company uh, that does the iPhones and all the uh, computer, uh, they have a solar farm in uh, China that controls and powers a lot of their uh, facilities. And uh, they believe in uh, being sustainable. Um, they, they also have acres, acres of land where they grow their own trees. Instead of going and chopping down trees, um, they grow their own trees and chop down their own trees and regrow them and chop them down and regrow them. Uh, oh, sustainable forestry, do. yeah. Yeah. That's, is that, is that's that for their paper needs? Um, oh, yeah. Even, even in here in our, in our region, I would say that, that Brazil um, is, a, is a fairly good example of a, of a diversified uh, energy mix um, from, with, with, with nuclear, hydro, um, biofuels, of course, the use of ethanol as a, as a flexi fuel was, was pioneered uh, in, in, in Brazil. Wow. Now, did they get that from the sugar cane? Because we use corn. Oh, yes, yes, they, they get it from sugar cane, which is much more efficient than, than, than getting from from corn. The energy you put into to the corn is the same amount of energy you get out um, in, the, in the fuel, whereas with sugar cane, you get seven times more energy uh, out than you, than you put in. Well, not only that, but also, isn't there the danger that a lot of the corn that they're growing is genetically modified and that has other repercussions to the environment? Well, it has other repercussions besides the GMO part of it. The, the corn, is, corn is food. It's, direct, it's, a, it's a staple. And so if you, if you, if you start growing um, food for fuel, uh, that, that has impacts on, on commodity prices and, and, and downstream impacts on economies that we didn't contemplate. Uh, these are heavy, these are heavy topics. So when you bring all this into the classroom, how how does this work? Because it's so complicated, and the problems are diverse. Oh, it's absolutely motivating because I'm I'm teaching um, people who are going to become doctors primarily, people who are going to wear put on that white coat and and and, and stethoscope and and become uh, symbols of authority um, in their in their in their countries. And, and, and that, to me, is inspiring, because if I can, if I can get them uh, to become climate change advocates, uh, then that's the way that we're going to change the world. And I, and I absolutely uh, think that the medical profession, because this is a public health issue, climate change is the greatest public health threat that we face. And therefore, the, 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 or, or, or medical people, our surgeons general, uh, mm-hmm. they have to become involved as well. Somebody told me, it may have been, it doesn't matter, somebody told me that because it's getting warmer, because we don't have the kind of winters that are, are as cold as they used to be, the viruses that circulate don't get wiped out as fast or, or don't get wiped out as much. And as a result, uh, virus cycles are, are sort of uninterrupted. And, and that is, is bad also for us because um, when it was colder, um, it acted as a deterrent or at least a check against viral growth. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or you know anything about that. Um, the way I would respond to that is, is that climate change is having uh, health impacts that some of them are direct, like um, heat strokes, um, direct impacts like extreme weather events, um, floods, uh, um, hurricanes, etc. Yes, uh, but it's also uh, changing um, the migration pack patterns and, and, and breeding patterns of, of, of vectors like uh, the Aedes aegypti. Uh, mosquito, which of, of course here in the tropics is, is of a lot of concern to us because that's that's a carrier of dengue, of, of, mm. of chikungunya, uh, and now and now this new one, Zika. Uh, and and you should be of, of, of course concerned in the in the in the U.S. because the the, the mosquito is now coming north as 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 temperatures and and climates warm. Um, so yes, we are absolutely concerned about about that changes in hydrological cycle um, as well. If you have if you have um, less water available, then you then you have sanitation uh, issues uh, that you have to deal with. 
uh, as well. And that's also going to be a public health uh, issue. They're also also linked to to increases incidences of, of, of asthma. Um, so there are there are a number of 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 health impacts that that climate change is is already causing. The, the, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, um, in in the U.S. has has pointed out about about ten areas where they where they think that much more research is is, is needed into the the impacts of climate change on on, on health. I think one of the things that we see here is is the, the mosquitoes, and one of the things that New York City is doing, unfortunately, is they have these uh, very very broad spectrum spray programs, and they're not, in my opinion, this is my opinion. I don't think they're using environmentally safe um, no. sprays. No. I think they're using something called Anvil. Uh, it's, you know, has, yeah. you know, they they use these trade names, but I have actually complained a lot because when you think about it, I, I have an organic garden in my backyard. And what do they do? They, they in the middle of the night, sometime between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., they have um, spraying. They just announce it. They, they don't even, and, and this, again, is an opinion, but they don't really tell people enough. And I've complained to all the local people who are in charge of these things and, and are in the information loop. And I'm like, look, if you're going to spray, I don't agree with the spraying, but if you're going to spray, can you at least give us some notice so I can bring the tomato plants and some of the things in the garage and cover them up and then cover up uh, the garden a little bit uh, with a tarp, so that I uh, that the fresh local organic vegetables that I'm growing <laughs> to be sustainable um, are not being poisoned, and uh, you know, uh, but but so the thing is, you know, it's like each problem creates another problem. So if the climate is changing, and if the mosquitoes are uh, advancing, and there's more viruses, and then there's more spraying, it just keep, it, you know, and then there's more spraying, there's more water pollution, and there's more. Uh, cancer, then it just seems like the, the the problems are just spiraling and escalating. I I would agree with that. I, I think here in the Caribbean, um, we also have um, uh, spraying programs that in in Barbados and, and in Grenada. I, I know that we use malathion um, as the as the active ingredient, um, and that's a that's a, a general um, uh, pesticide. Um, uh, uh, that that would then have residual impacts on 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 water bodies and of, of course your pollinators your bees etc. So so I yes I agree but we've got it's a it's a balance we've got to kill the vector um, or, or else we're going to have um, epidemics of, of of dengue and and uh, and, and other uh, diseases that are, that are um, driven by these vectors. Right, and those are really nasty diseases. You know. Yeah, they can kill. Yeah. So, so the problem is, you know, so who are the people who are actually making the decisions on all of this on a science level? And where are the think tanks of the world where this information is being analyzed and looked at and discussed? Well, there's something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And that, this panel consists of, of um, a couple of hundred of scientists uh, representing all of the governments of the, of the world. And this 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 panel doesn't do the science itself. It it, it reviews all of the relevant scientific um, articles and it publishes a summary um, every six or seven uh, years. So the, the the fifth assessment report, which is the latest one, uh, came out in 2013 and 2014, and 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 that that report um, is 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 the is the latest science um, that that all of us um, basically trust. But so where but where where are the think tanks that they draw upon? So no, that's the body. Well, they're, that they're all they're all over the world. NASA, of course, um, the, the the U.S. has been a a, a leader in, in in climate change uh, science. Of course, you have people like James Hansen uh, at NASA. Uh, you have NOAA, uh, your National Oceanographic um, uh, Administration. Uh, that that's also a, a, a leader. You have the the Potsdam Institute. Uh, in, in in Germany, that that's a world leader uh, as well. Um, here in the Caribbean, we've been doing some research um, at the University of the West Indies. Um, I, 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 was, I have every single major campus um, is uh, in the world is doing research on, on on climate change from from Australia to the impacts on the on the barrier reef uh, to to India with their energy research uh, in, institute um, all over the world. Can I ask you a question? How much of that research uh, do they take in consideration 
uh, the universe, space, when it comes to climate change, the sun. Um, oh, well, the sun, the sun, of course, is the, is the, is the primary radiative force. So, so, um, the, the impacts of, of, of sunspots, um, any, any change in the, in the, in the Earth's uh, angle towards the sun, or any, any change in the Earth's orbit, all of that is put into the, into the climate model. Okay. But, cause, you know, Stephen Hawkins said one time that, you know, when the universe was first created, you know, it, the Earth is still, um, actually being created. It's still evolving. And he said that uh, there's going to be changes accordingly to all the, the way the planets work out, alignment and so on. He says that uh, it changes the weather, but that we also contribute to climate change. You know, it's human factor, too. So in your study, you took all that thing. In, in, do they do a study on both? and come out with some kind of resolution? Is that what it is? Right, before oh, you, ab ab absolutely. Hold that thought. We have to, and absolutely. Okay. But we have to take a hard break here because that's the, that's the radio rules. <laughs> this is Richard okay. Solomon, Antonio Sion, and Dr. Yusili, who's got an answer for Antonio's question, which we will review right after this. All right, welcome back. So, Antonio, before the break with our guest, um, Dr. Yusili from Grenada. There was a question pending, but we had to take a break. So would you reintroduce the question so our good friend, the doctor, uh, can give his, his brilliant answer? Yeah, Stephen, you know, Stephen Hawkins uh, ha has always, uh, you know, I, also myself, I always wanted to know if the calculation that you do for climate change, does it take the factor uh, that, you know, the world is changing, is expanding, because the universe obviously continues to change. And I just want to know if that has any factor on the changes of the Earth and your calculations when you deal with the human factor. Um, 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 my response to that is yes, uh, absolutely. I, I think I said before we, we took the break. The, the, the climate models take, take that into account. And, they, and it is recognized that, that over geological time, we've had significant changes in, in, in surface temperatures, both for, for the land and, and, the, and the oceans. We've had... We've had ice ages, and then we've had interglacial uh, periods. So we are in an interglacial period now. What what the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, the IPCC, what that group of, of experts has said unequivocally now is that the the rate of, of, of warming that we're seeing now, we have never ever seen in, in the last eight hundred thousand years of, of of climate data that we've been able to gather from 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 ice cores. Uh, and, 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 and satellite data, et, et cetera. So it is now absolutely clear that, that, that one, climate change is occurring uh, outside of what is normally uh, and, and ge a, a normal geological uh, occurrence, and that two, mankind is causing this climate change. That Those two facts are now unequivocal. So I have a, a, a related question. How many people are on the Earth now and at what point is the tipping point that we cannot sustain the population? That, like, in other words, you were saying how it, maybe a two degree difference, we would have a two meter rise in the water level. At what point do we have a Earth population that exceeds the planet's ability to, to sustain that? Well, let's look at it from a climate change standpoint alone. So we're looking at, at the Earth carrying capacity as far as um, people go, we're not we're not looking at being able to feed them or or, or house them, etc. But we're looking at their carbon footprint, and we've got seven billion people on 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 the Earth um, right now, and our our carbon footprint is is somewhere around um, ten gigatons of 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 CO two equivalent per year. Um, on a per capita basis, and, and the average American is emitting around, I don't know, a, a bit more than 20 tons of carbon uh, dioxide per year. Um, uh, a, a poor person in, in, in India is probably emitting less than, than, than two. On a, on a global basis, for us to be sustainable and keep that warming to, to less than two degrees Celsius, we all have to be at less than, say, five uh, tons of carbon uh, per person per year. If you want to do it on a, on a per capita basis, which I think is perhaps the most equitable way uh, to look at it. And how as we as, as, as every single individual of the seven billion of us, uh, need to, to, 
uh, to reduce our own footprint. Now, the world's population is projected to increase um, by, by 2050. Some of the estimates say up to 15 billion, but the most uh, conservative estimate says that we will peak at around 9 uh, billion people. So that's the population side of it. But our carbon emissions is not only, the, it's our, it's not only our population, it's our affluence. It's, it's, it's how big our economies are. And we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a global GDP of around, and I'm, I'm, I'm rounding off numbers, somewhere around 70 trillion uh, U.S. dollars of, is, is our global GDP. But that will double, double by, wow. by, by, by 2050. So it's, it's, it's not only population that, that drives things, it's, it's, it's technology. So, so um, our populations will, will stabilize, but each one of us, our carbon footprint will increase unless we do something about it. Well, especially because we're using more and more electronics, more and more devices. You know, <laughs> just think of this from a – because I deal with a lot of construction and construction litigation, things like that. When you look at an old apartment or an old home, in the wall there was like maybe one outlet – over here and one outlet over there and they had the two prong outlet and there's only you know one above the other now you need you know power sticks uh that you know, because you have your vcr you have your cell phone you have your answer machine you got your your tv uh you have a lamp you have uh some kind of external drive you may have a fax or, or uh some other kind of device or a scan or whatever we, we didn't have these levels of devices all those years ago. In, you know, years and no. years and years ago, you had a phone. It didn't have an answering machine. And if you weren't home, there wasn't even a place to leave a message, <laughs> you know? And yeah, but, but the, the, the good thing is we've become a hell of a lot more efficient in our, in our resource use. I mean, what the exciting thing about the U.S. is that if you look at data coming out of the U.S. in the last couple of years, Post the recession in 2008, because there was a, an artificial drop in, in, in U.S. emissions because manufacturing went down and, and, and the whole economies went down after the recession. If you look at 2014, 2015, I haven't seen 2016 data yet, there's a phenomenon occurring, what we call decoupling, where, where you are getting an, an increase in your GDP, but you're not seeing a commensurate increase in emissions. That's good news. What do you attribute that to? That's, 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 that's better efficiency. That's right, better but, energy efficiency. But that's where is that efficiency coming from? At the power plant level, at the user level, every level, better cars? Every level, at the power plant level, at the car level, because, because um, and I, I know you don't want to speak about po politics, but, but uh, someone mm -hmm. called Obama um, uh, introduced um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, fuel efficiency uh, limits for, for, for cars. And, and, and that's, that's big. Well, um, California so, so, was always pushing that before anybody else. In fact, I think... California led the country in you know, emissions uh, standards. Absolutely, and, yeah. absolutely. Well, Governor Governor Schwarzenegger was uh, he was high when it came to uh, in the environment. He was big on it. But that's, huge. but that's the message I would like to get across is that is that the U.S. is showing to some extent, to some extent, because you can you can't argue that a lot of the manufacturing is also pushed overseas, so that the iPhone is is designed in California but manufactured in China. So, so, so who's, right. who's responsible for the footprint? Okay, let's, that, let's take that argument and set that aside for, for a while. There is still a phenomenon occurring in the U.S. where you do have a growth in the economy without a growth in carbon emissions. But That's I also heard that Apple is now they're going to be doing renovations on a lot of their uh, stores in the United States where they're going to be replacing the tiles on the floor with uh, solar tiles. So I read that. I, yeah, I read that article not too long ago. I'm talking about maybe two and a half weeks ago, and I, my hair stood up because I said to myself, "It's about time." Now, what do solar tiles on the floor do? How does that work? The same, the same way. And you know how? Did you ever go to an Apple store? Yeah, uh, it's transparent. It's 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 made out of glass, so right. the sun goes directly right on it, and in all the facilities. A design on an open sky, meaning you can see the sky. It's like blue. Like a skyline. And every facility, yeah. right. So it's it's perfect. And and how they design it, it's just beautiful. You know, when I read the article, I was just blown away because, you know, I'm, I'm speculating New York City because you know how I am with New York, and I'm very disappointed. They're moving very slowly, but yet they have the money for it and the budget for it. They keep announcing how all the... The New York schools, the high schools, you know, Board of Education are going to be doing solar energy. on all, But it's taking such a long time, and I, I really don't understand why it's taking. They have the money for it. They just need to do it. But it was very interesting to read that, and I got excited because, you know, I'm, I'm a supporter of solar. 
Um, and, you know, Apple, to me, um, it's huge when it comes to being sustainable. So, so Dr. anyway, where, where are the... the- price- and the price of solar is coming down. Um, there was a, yeah. a, a, a big, big solar farm that was um, just awarded in uh, in the Middle East of all of all places. Um, and the, I think it was in um, it was an Abu Dhabi uh, firm that, that that won the bid, and they uh, started to bring numbers in, but they won uh, the bid at at, at six oh. cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, that's 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 low. Um, the, the price of electricity here in Grenada with 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 diesel. Um, um, Combustion is is close to forty U.S. cents per kilowatt hour, and you have a solar plant coming in at six cents per per kilowatt hour. This stuff is becoming highly highly competitive. The other the other phenomenon that, that that's occurring is is this issue of distributed generation. The, the fact that that any householder now can put a solar PV uh, panel on their roof and become their own generator. We we're calling it here in Grenada the, the democratization of of electricity generation. So there's a there's a social impact that's occurring. The electric utility company, though, the, the company that, that's responsible for centralized generation is, is, is seeing a threat to its business model. Um, and that's happened across the world uh, as well. There is a, we're on the cusp of a revolution um, in, in, in electricity generation. Uh, a friend of mine who lives in Long Island put solar all over his house, and he actually puts money, uh, he puts uh, electricity into the grid, and he gets like a refund. Exactly. Like, imagine if all of us did that. Then, then the the utility company uh, would have to change its business model. Well, then they no just charge for the distribution. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they would just be responsible for the grid. Well, that, look, uh, what's interesting is my friend's electric bills are are either <laughs> either he gets a refund or they're incredibly low. And then imagine with him with a, with an electric vehicle in his garage that has a huge battery in it. Exactly. So he wouldn't have to fill up every week. You know, one thing yep, I can tell yeah. you is that I, I've not really noticed a big improvement in miles per gallon in cars over the years. I, I've driven all kinds of cars for a long, long period of time, and, and it seems like, for the most part, we haven't seen in the last 30 years a big leap in in, in what, you know, it's always been in the 20s, 20 miles, you know, 20, 27 miles what per gallon. What do gallon. you expect if you have vertically integrated companies and the, and the fossil fuel companies are... are, mm-hmm. are are significant shareholders in the automotive industry. What do you expect? Right, because that's absolutely true. Because you know, the thing is, you'd think that in 30 years, at least we'd be getting 50, 60 miles to the gallon, but we don't. So we engineers, we invented the internal combustion engine. Uh, I think Ford did it, um, and, and we haven't come along uh, much much since, since then. I, I absolutely agree with you. Not, not, only, not only the internal combustion engine in, in cars, but also our or thermodynamic efficiencies in our electricity generation. We are, we're, we're still down to 30 40% uh, of, of, of efficiencies. We're, we're losing a hell of a lot of energy. Do, do, yeah. you, do you see electric cars becoming commonplace? Absolutely. Commonplace, Absolutely. as opposed to Absolutely. a fad or just trend setting? No, go to Netherlands. Go, 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 go to the Netherlands and see. They, I think for, for the first time last year, electric vehicles were, were almost outnumbering uh, the, the, the sale of conventional vehicles. Well, I, I went over to Barbados um, just 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 last week, and there's a, there's a company there uh, selling electric vehicles and and, and putting uh, charging stations uh, around the island. Electric vehicles are here to stay. Well, I know and that they will you know, capture more of the market as 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 consumers recognize that this is the way that we, that we can go. I know that Israel. You know, what I ask people. Uh, you know, what I ask people, um, what are we going to do with the batteries? That was the question I was talking about from, yeah. from the from the cars. What are we going to do yeah. with all those batteries? Yeah, I, think, I, I think that's a fair question, that, that we have to get better uh, battery technology. We, we are getting better te- battery technology. We're no longer talking about the lead-acid mm-hmm. uh, batteries. Um, you, as you know, Tesla uh, is doing a hell of a lot of research in this, in this area. And whoever comes up with the, with, with the best storage devices, um, I think is going to capture the global market, not only for, for, for transport, but, but for the household right as well. Well, I know that Israel has a whole plan right now for uh, electric vehicles and where you, um, instead of recharging your vehicle, you pull into like a station and then you swap your battery for one that's already charged. Yeah. And they're planning yeah. on doing that like around the country. Now, I guess yes, it, and that, and that, that, that speeds up your, your, your charging time as well because you're not, you're not sitting there waiting uh, to, to, be, to be charged. But 
generally, if we put our minds to it, um, if and, 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 and we put our political will there, and I think that's that's one area that the U.S. has always been been, been strong in. Um, that innovation will come, and and and, and I'm absolutely uh, convinced that that the world will be a bright place. Uh, we will all uh, be able to achieve the quality of life that that we want, um, and and still have a planet that's that's sustainable. Wow. So, if somebody comes to your country and says, "I want to do this film, this movie," um, you know, done by a huge director, huge actors, and and all of a sudden they come to you with a plan and says, "Well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this explosion scene here, and we're going to have two hundred, two thousand two hundred twenty-three gallons of kerosene and seventy-two pounds." of powder explosives, and this is all going to create uh, a, a huge blast. Uh, and they're going to use about 150,000 pounds of TNT. What would you say to that? I'm, I, am, I am not an expert in what, in what the impacts of, of uh, in terms of global emissions are, the pyrotechnics right. that, that are done in, in, the, in, the, in the film industry. If, if, right. if you consider it a, a, a significant issue, then, then I'm sure that technology also can be brought to bear that you don't, you don't have well, to use all that kerosene, et cetera, to have that visual effect that, that, they, that the director is looking for. Right. But let me ask you a question. What is, uh, in your experience, uh, during combustion, uh, kerosene, what happens um, when, when kerosene is released? Uh, what, what, what happens? Like, does it... No, kerosene is a is a a, a hydrocarbon. Um, right. So it's gonna it's, it's it's relatively volatile. It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna break down. It's it's, it's going to um, evaporate eventually and go into the atmosphere. Now, if right. it breaks down into into methane, the the, the smallest um, hydrocarbon, methane has a has a global warming potential of around twenty three um, compared to mm -hmm. carbon dioxide as as one. What I'm trying to get at is, is better to burn the kerosene than to let it evaporate. If you, if right. you let it evaporate, it, it, it causes more problems than if you just combust it and turn it into, in, into CO2. Um, that, that's, that's, for, uh, that's, that's because of the methane. So uh, one, of the, yeah. one of the biggest things that we can do to mitigate climate change, for example, is, is to flare all the natural gas that, that, that's escaping from, 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 from uh, oil wells um, around, right. around right. the world. I, I can't thank you enough for bringing wisdom, scholarship, intellect, uh, science, and authenticity to the airwaves. So thank you for that. Well, if, well, well thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the, that, that opportunity. I'm not sure that I brought all that intellect myself. There, there's a huge cadre of, of, of scientists out there who are, who are doing the, the, the work. I'm, I'm just acting as, 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 as a mouthpiece for, for, for some of them. Um, and, I, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to to, to speak to your to your audience, as I as I said at the beginning, I'm a negotiator for a constituency of, of, of small islands that are the most right. vulnerable to, to climate change in the in, in the world. We didn't cause climate change, but uh, we're the ones that are feeling the, the impact. And uh, un unless the rest of the world uh, changes right. uh, the, the way it, it does things, uh, then then we will cease to exist. So that message has to get out there. Uh, Doctor Seal, do you have an email or any kind of address if people want to get in touch with you or, or send comments? I can be reached at, at, at hcle at sgu.edu, um, hcle at sgu.edu. And if not, you can always send us an email. We'll make sure we forward it because we have all the contact information. That was an incredibly powerful hour of radio. Thank you, uh, Antonio, as always being just a, a tremendous producer and a person who finds incredible guests. Thank you, Doc. Uh, that's it for us. We'll see you in a week. Bye.